Good evening. It's Friday, June 21st, 2013. My name is Matthew Ogden, and I'm proud to be hosting tonight's live webcast from LaRouchePack.com. Tonight, we're joined by, of course, Mr. LaRouche in the studio, uh, as we are every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for our regular series of live webcasts. And I'll also be joined tonight by Leandra Bernstein, who will be asking a series of questions along with myself. Uh, now, we have a question which has come in from an institutional contact in Washington, and Mr. LaRouche has requested that we begin with the presentation of that question. So I'd like to ask Leandra to come to the podium to present that question. All right, before I uh, read that question, I think it's important for our viewers to know that in Delaware, just at the end of this week, there was a very heavy-handed uh, intervention by none other than J.P. Morgan into the passage of a simple resolution at the state level in the state legislature in Delaware. Uh, in the Delaware Senate Banking Committee on Thursday, uh, the, uh, the state Senate resolution number nine came up to be, uh, to be voted on, uh, and it was sponsored by Senator Ennis re request, uh, calling on the U.S. Congress to reinstate Glass-Steagall, pass H.R. 129. Now, in the course of the discussion of this, uh, of this resolution, uh, Senator Ennis cited the 66 years in which Glass-Steagall was a law, leading into its uh, repeal, uh, which led directly to the 2008 crisis. In the course of his remarks, he made multiple references to, uh, to the prospect of bail-in coming to the United States, from Cyprus to the United States. All of a sudden, in this, uh, in this hearing, uh, the re a representative of the Mid-Atlantic Financial Services Association intervened to say it would be unwise to pass this resolution uh, and that it should be tabled and it should be subject to, uh, there should be extensive further discussion about what, what really caused the crisis of 2008. Then a representative from J.P. Morgan intervened to say it is very inadvisable for Delaware of all states to pass this resolution at this time. Now it should be noted that Delaware is in fact the home of a very large banking banking industry and uh, it was a, an interesting experience for members of this committee in the Delaware Senate to come into the room to have it filled with bank lobbyists and the LaRouche Pack organizer who um, who was working on this state noted that uh, usually you only have hearings on a bill this is just a resolution this didn't involve the resolution to uh, to reinstate to call on Congress to reinstate Glass-Steagall did not require the changing of any law. Uh, it didn't involve spending any money. But still, the House was packed with these banking lobbyists. So uh, there, was, there was a very heated back and forth between the main sponsor of the bill and the representative from J.P. Morgan, who noted that similar resolutions, he can, he, his his intervention against Glass-Steagall was to say that similar resolutions have been introduced in 17 states, but only passed in three. So clearly he has not been following the LaRouche Pack website, the Glass-Steagall page, otherwise he'd know that it has been introduced in 22 states and passed in four. Uh, and then he went on the the debate went on, and uh, to each to each uh, intervention the senator made, there was a retort from the from the banking industry, except on the issue of 
of Balin. Now, I uh, just to uh, we'll get to the uh, the history of J.P. Morgan in just a minute in the institutional question where this is where this is brought up, but it is notable that in uh, J.P. Morgan executive Jamie Dimon's the anteroom to his office, there is the um, the brace of pistols used originally in the duel between Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, and the legacy of J.P. Morgan is one of immense treason uh, with the uh, with the original incarnation of J.P. Morgan being the Manhattan Company, which was the swindle that Aaron Burr pulled uh, on the state of New York City when the National Bank wouldn't give him the money to start a start a counter bank. But uh, I just want to throw into the mix another element on J.P. Morgan before we get directly to the question. Uh, this week, a 16-page report from J.P. Morgan was uh, it, it was it, it was taken to the public with quotes from this report, uh, saying that the problem the problem with Europe and the problem with further banking integration in Europe is uh, is that they have gone away from the fascist constitutions of. Uh, pre-World War II and gone to democratic uh, constitutions. This, uh, this report, they stated, the constitutions and political settlements in the southern periphery of Europe put in place in the aftermath of the fall of fascism have a number of features which appear to be unsuited to further integration in the region. So again, this from J.P. Morgan. Um, but to get to get to the question, uh, the questioner asks, Mr. LaRouche, this week a lobbyist for J.P. Morgan Chase appeared before the Delaware State Senate to argue against a resolution calling on the House and Senate delegates to support the reinstating of Glass-Steagall bills now before the House and Senate in H.R. 129 and S-985. The fact that J.P. Morgan which was the architect of the repeal of Glass-Steagall beginning in 1984, came out publicly in their own name to attempt to block the passage of the Delaware Resolution is indicative of the fact that the fight for Glass-Steagall is reaching a tipping point. The population has no stomach for bankers, the bailouts did nothing for the real economy, and now J.P. Morgan has made the decision that they must step in openly to defend the repeal and the consequences. Back in 1984, it was a J.P. Morgan task force chaired by Alan Greenspan and including William Dudley, the current president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, that spelled out the strategy for repealing the 1933 law breaking up the Depression era, too big to fa fail banks. When Greenspan was appointed as chairman of the Fed in 87, he put all of his weight behind the repeal of Glass-Steagall, which finally occurred in 99. Is it your view that the emergence of J.P. Morgan in the Delaware hearing in such an eff open effort to block the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall is an indication that we have now entered the beginning of the final battle for Glass-Steagall? Are we at the tipping point where the enemies of Glass-Steagall had no choice but to come out openly in defense of a policy that has had devastating consequences for the overwhelming majority of Americans. Okay. The situation is such that despite the fact that for some long period of time, even during the course of this year to date, that the opposition the, to what J.P. Morgan represents was considered a loser. That has changed, and that is the crucial change. That J.P. Morgan came out with all full fists and so forth to show this thing indicates that they are frightened. And because we do have, in the U.S. population, 
to the surprise of many members of the Congress, we do have a trend, an accelerating trend, toward Glass-Steagall. Now, people generally in the United States don't really know what Glass-Steagall is. They do know some of the things it means, and those things are very clear, and that is sufficient to motivate them. The, the point is that from my standpoint, the, they do not really understand what is going on, but they understand enough to be right. And they are, this, this confidence is rising up in them, is manifesting itself. And only very, very dirty tricks could at this point really stop Class Steagall. In any ordinary kind of uh, process, in the U.S. Congress, Class Steagall would win. The temperament is for that. And the enemies of Glass Steagall know it. And that's what the significance is of the event this past week. Now, this goes further. When I say that many, very few Americans understand what the issue, bottom issue, really is, because the point is, is that J, what J.P. Morgan represents and the international bailout system, and it's like this. It is hopelessly bankrupt. It could never survive. It could never come back to life. The ratio of debt, which is, we're talking about trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars of worthless debt, and there's no sign that it will ever improve. As a matter of fact, it will not, not under them. What they would tend to do, obviously, means that they're, they know this. I mean, happened J.P. Morgan does have a few pieces of competence. It does know what's going on around its business. It has no intention of ever finding an equitable resolution of the bankruptcy of the international monetarist system. The entire transatlantic system of monetarism is hopelessly bankrupt. We're talking about quadrillions of dollars of these banks. They are absolutely worthless. They will never repay. They never could. They never intended to. What they intend is obviously dictatorship. Now, from our standpoint, what, what's the situation? We, we, people do, do not understand Glass-Steagall fully. They understand Glass-Steagall. They like it. They're right in what their opinion is on this. They don't know the deeper, deeper issue. <clears throat> the deeper, deeper issue is that under the U.S. Constitution, the original U.S. Constitution and its laws, we do not have a banking system in the ordinary sense as a national banking system. We have a credit system. Now, this was a difficult question that came up in terms of Alexander Hamilton. The other representatives did not understand how to deal with this thing. We, we, here we had U.S. debt, war debts, war debts to many nations, the nations that have assisted us in getting our freedom. But the, the idea of how are we going to pay the debts that we had incurred in defending ourselves against the British Empire. And Alexander Hamilton came up with a solution. It was the obvious solution. It had been there before. The Massachusetts, Massachusetts Bay Colony had already had an intention in this direction, which some people remembered. And even though the Massachusetts Bay Colony was crushed by the Anglo-Dutch interests, and the Dutch played a key role in this operation, some people forgot the lesson of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, Hamilton came up with it. We do not believe in the kind of banking system as a national banking system that these jokers believe in. And most people would more or less tend to accept it unless they were very angry at being cheated. Then they would, that would change their viewpoint. Our system is a credit system. Our system is not a monetary system. It's a credit system. In, the assumption is, as Hamilton laid this out, is we have a program under which we grow the economy. We increase the pro productive powers of labor. 
In other words, we don't try to balance the budget, we unbalance the budget. We, we have a, a budgetary plan, a national plan of, of management under which we do nothing unless we're going to grow the economy. And therefore, the money that the United States government puts up as credit in the name of the United States government is intended to grow. It's not to go deeper, more deeply into debt. Yes, we go into debt, but we, we do it by growing more rapidly than we go into debt. And that's the way the system worked. That's what Franklin Roosevelt did before the war actually started. That was his intention. That's been our intention. We are not a monetarist system. And the problem is that every nation of Europe is based on a monetarist system, which is essentially the British Empire, the European system of imperialism. We are not. We are a unique nation. There are some nations that have tried to you know, imitate us and so forth. That's good, highly recommended if they know how to do it. But the point is, the idea is that the federal government backs up credit which is created through the federal system. This credit is then used you know, to sub fund the growth of the economy through productivity. For example, in the old, old system, you would have a situation in the United States in which the farmers would be, be in debt you know, in order to farm. Then when, they, when the farmers had sold what they had to sell and made an income, then this, the turn went now to the manufacturers and similar kinds of people. So the idea is that the federal government gives credit, but it organizes the giving of credit, but the credit is always based on growth, physical and related growth of the economy, increase of the productive powers of labor, unlike any European system. Now, what, the, what the, these clowns have from J.P. Morgan and Company is they have no way that they could ever bail out, actually, and then endgame this issue. If we do not get Glass-Steagall now, if we do not pass Glass-Steagall now, the United States will be destroyed because it will be a victim of a dictatorship which had to cancel quadrillions of dollars of debt that it could never pay and never intended to pay. So when J.P. Morgan comes in, considering what they know about their business, one would have to say that unless they've suddenly gone stupid and lost the idea of what their intentions are, they're finished. But if we don't get in Glass-Steagall, we're finished too. And if we, if we win, if we get Glass-Steagall, Glass, J.P. Morgan and banks like it will never again appear on the surface of this planet. So the job is get this thing through fast. The American people are ready for it. They need it. It's the only hope we have. We have to create more employment. We have to create income and producing employment for the nation. We have to go back to the principle of, of Alexander Hamilton. And that's our system. We're going back to it. And we can promise the people of this nation that if Glass-Steagall is put through now, considering the kind of temperament the nation has to have in order to get Glass-Steagall through, we're going to have the greatest recovery that mankind have ever, has ever known.